Fasting is meant to expose our weaknesses, our vulnerability, our impotence before our God, and our reliance on Him. Heavenly Father, as we come to look now at Jesus' words, help us to understand them and help us by your Spirit to live in the light of them. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please you take a seat. I want to begin uh, tonight by telling you about the behaviour of two men. Uh, they're real men, but I'm not going to tell you their names. Uh, the first man prided himself on being a great and loving husband. Then one day his wife got upset when he brought home a bunch of flowers. He asked her why, and her response packed quite a punch. She pointed out that for years he had brought her flowers, but only when they were about to have guests. Implication? He did what he did in order to be seen by others and admired by them for being such a wonderful husband. Another friend posted on Facebook a lovely photo and message to his wife once a year on their anniversary. Only his wife wasn't on Facebook and he never showed her the post. She just heard about it from others who, thought, who told her how lucky she was to have such a wonderful and loving husband. She too wasn't impressed. Why? Well, again, he did what he did in order to be seen by others. Both claimed to love their wives, both did a good thing, but both also obviously showing off. And it's not a pretty picture, is it? Well, Jesus confronts us with a similar picture tonight in our Bible passage, where we again find someone doing a good thing, fasting, but they're not doing it to focus on God. They're not doing it to show their love to him. They're doing it to be seen and no doubt admired by those who see them doing it. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 16 to 18. If you're not there already, it's on page 811. And we're going to be looking at those few verses this evening. As Jonathan said earlier, we're in the middle of a sermon series where Jesus is teaching those who are gathered with him on the top of a mountain. And our verses come in a section that begins from chapter 6, verse 1, and uh, goes through to the end of our passage tonight. But let's look back to chapter 6, verse 1, and hear what Jesus says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So what we see here is the general principle that Jesus is teaching us. There are things that we're tempted to do for God in order to be seen by those around us. And the point of these verses is very simple. Jesus says, stop it. And having taught us the principle, Jesus then gives us three examples. The first is giving. You can see that in verses two to four. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. The second example is prayer. Look at verses 5 and 6. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So that's the context, and it brings us to our passage for this evening. So look again at verses 16 to 18 in that third example of fasting. And when you fast... Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they discover their faces, disfigure their faces, and their fasting, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, 
anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So as we begin our time together, I want to make really clear that the main point Jesus makes in these few verses is this. Do not practice your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. If we do, then God is not impressed. We may get a reward, but it won't be from God. People's praise may or may not come, and even if it does come, it won't last very long. These verses don't mean that we can't do these things with one another, but our motive should not be to seek attention for ourselves. Rather, it should be in response to the love that has been shown us through Christ. This is quite a challenge. We mustn't duck it. We mustn't think this is the message for someone else. Jesus tells us here to beware. This is a serious warning. So how are we in danger of doing good things in order to impress others? Don't think this will be over quickly. It's a lifelong battle. It's not something we'll tick on a list and then move on. This warning, this danger remains with us and we need to stay on guard. So I hope it's clear that Jesus' main point here is to warn us about the wrong motives that we can have when we fast. However, it's good to spend a good chunk of our remaining time thinking about fasting itself, because Jesus takes it for granted that his disciples fasted, and he takes it for granted that they knew about fasting. And that's probably not true of us. And so we need to slow down and learn from what Jesus says here about fasting itself. Now, before we do that, let me say that I am aware that for some of us, food is a sensitive area to be talking about. Because you may have a complex and difficult relationship with food, perhaps a a habit of comfort eating that's beginning to get out of control, or maybe it's something that's more serious. If you're aware that that's the case for you, please do seek help. I'd encourage you to talk to a mature Christian that you trust, who can help you, There's also a group at JPC called Celebrate Recovery, where you'll find help to work through issues like these. And I'd also highly recommend the books by Emma Shrivener, who knows firsthand the struggle of an eating disorder. You'll likely also need help from the medical profession, but realize you're not alone in your struggle. But you also need to know that fasting is not for everyone, and most probably not for you at this point. I also know that there's a lot written about fasting by nutritionists and within the sporting world, and so an increasing number of people are building into the regular routines of their lives, not eating, because of health benefits. It'll become obvious when we think a bit more about um, how the Bible defines fasting that that isn't really what we're talking about here, but it is interesting to note that there is a wider interest in this. Now, my guess is that for many Christians today, particularly in the UK, fasting is hardly ever talked about and probably hardly ever practiced. But I know that for many watching this around the world on Clayton TV uh, or our friends in other countries, that may not be their experience. I know it's not been the case throughout the world now. It's also not been the case through church history. So let me give you one example of that. In this country, one of the 33 official sermons of the Church of England, called the Homilies, uh, one of which was written in 1571, was about fasting. Those sermons were designed to be read in every church in the land. Just one topic out of 33, which shows how important fasting was considered in the life of ordinary Christians at that time. Many of you know, and probably getting sick of me talking about it now, but recently I had a sabbatical and I spent a few months in an Anglican church in Singapore. And I was really struck by the amazing depth of love that the staff team had for God and for one another. And it was particularly apparent at their staff meetings. But it was only in the last week that I began to realize that many of the staff had a habit of fasting each week, ending the fast with their weekly staff prayer meeting and staff meal. It's then that my mind kind of went back and I remembered all the polite declines of cups of coffee and biscuits uh, every Tuesday morning the whole time I'd been there. 
Uh, but I was quite struck when I realized this, and it got me thinking myself about fasting, and I realized that in my own growth as a Christian, I've received very little encouragement or teaching to fast. And I know that I'm not alone in that. So why is that? Well, perhaps part of the answer is because in the New Testament, and we see that in this passage as well, there are no direct commands to fast. And Jesus actually doesn't make that much of fasting. Now, it's true, and we need to notice, that Jesus does say here, when you fast. As he said in verse 2, when you give to the needy, and verse 5, when you pray. But that isn't quite the same as saying, you should fast, and when you do, do this. So fasting is, I think, a little bit different to the first two examples, where we can go elsewhere in the New Testament and find teaching that instructs followers of Jesus to give and to pray, and for example, you can see it even in this passage where prayer, so with prayer, it's not just verse 2, when you pray, but we also have verse 9, pray then like this. With fasting, however, we find that it's mainly just described. There are many examples uh, throughout the Bible. We'll look at one or two of them uh, tonight. But despite it being quite common, it's never directly commanded. And so fasting is an area where Christians have freedom. And when you put that together with the warnings about fasting, such as the warning we have in this passage, not to fast in a way that shows off, maybe it's not surprising that fasting isn't very common. But actually, given that it's particularly uncommon in our part of the world, maybe it actually says something about us and the fact that we note that it's not commanded and decide, in fact, not to use our freedom to do it well, but rather to not do it at all. Now, I think we need to take seriously that Jesus here does use fasting as an example, lined up as he does, again, lining up as he does with giving and praying. There's not a direct command here, but surely it's fair to say that Jesus is assuming it. He doesn't say, if you fast, he says, when you fast. And on the lips of Jesus, that is very strong. Just flip over a couple of pages to page 814 and uh, to Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. And, and, and we'll see Jesus again here speaking about fasting. I think these verses are very helpful. Look at verse 14. This is what Jesus says. Uh, this is what uh, the verses say. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? So what we see in this verse is that fasting was a common practice among the disciples of John the Baptist and among the Pharisees, the Jews. And actually, they find it quite shocking that Jesus' disciples don't fast. But listen to how Jesus replies. This is verse 15. Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guest mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? There was something special about the time when Jesus was with them, and it meant that it was actually inappropriate to fast. And what's interesting in this verse is he links fasting to mourning. When you're mourning, fasting is appropriate. But they weren't fasting because uh, they weren't mourning because Jesus was with them. So fasting while Jesus was with them is just as inappropriate as behaving at a wedding in the same way that you'd behave at a funeral. It's just not appropriate. But he goes on to say that the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, he's talking about himself, and then they will fast. Again, it's described, it's not commanded, but it's hard, isn't it, to escape the assumption that Jesus makes here that those living in the days between his first coming and his return at the end of the world, that's us, will fast. So let me recap. We mustn't give or pray or fast in order to show off. We're not commanded to fast, but there is a strong assumption made by Jesus that his disciples will fast, just as they will live generous lives and just as they will live prayerful lives. Jesus clearly expected his followers to fast after he had gone. So it is odd that this is not a widespread habit amongst all Christians. Well, for the next uh, part of the sermon, let's look at four 
questions about fasting. And the first is this, what is fasting? Now, can I say, I do want to helpfully define fasting uh, to explain what it is and what it's not. But more than that, I would love to begin to paint for you a picture that helps you see that fasting could be a wonderful thing to, to add to your lives as disciples of Jesus. So that we don't do it because we feel we ought to, but because we see how helpful it could be as a spiritual habit in our lives. But for those of you who love definitions, here it comes. Fasting is deliberately going without food to focus on God. It's not just eating less, as helpful as uh, some would find it, including me. In fact, if you view it as a spiritual weight loss program, then it's not really fasting at all. In fact, it has another name, it's called dieting. The purpose is not weight loss or getting cholesterol under control, as helpful as those things may be. No, fasting is intentionally focusing on God, particularly important in the middle of a busy and distracted life. And so if you fast in order to spend more time on your phone, then you've missed the point. We fast to focus on God. And it's important to say, as obvious as it may be, that fasting is not to earn God's approval. Fasting is not to impress him. We can't do that by anything we do. Only Jesus' death on the cross can do that. And fasting is not twisting his arm to give us what we ask for in prayer, like a hunger strike until God does as we ask, or like a toddler having a tantrum to try and get their own way. Well, that's what is fasting. Why then do we fast? Well, here's a helpful quote from Jim Packer that I found helpful. He says this, in scripture, we see several purposes for fasting. It's a way of sharing that we depend on God alone and draw all of our strength and resources from him. It's a way of focusing totally on him when seeking his guidance and help, and of showing that you really are earnest in your quest. It's also at times an appropriate expression of sorrow and deep repentance, something that a person or a community will do in order to acknowledge failure before God and to seek his mercy. Now, this may sound a bit strange, but the point of fasting is not simply to free up more time for Bible reading and prayer. It might help you to do that. However, if you've got a family to feed or you eat your lunch on the go anyway, then fasting may not add a lot of extra time. And in fact, it may mean that you're weaker than you normally are and unable to properly focus on study and prayer. So what is the point? What is the purpose of fasting? Well, again, it's obvious, but the point of fasting is to get hungry, to get us to a point where we acutely feel our need for food. Why on earth would we want to do that? How can that be of any spiritual benefit? Well, hunger confronts us with the reality of our own mortality, that we depend on God for life and what we need to live. Fasting helps us to realize that we are created and not the creator, that we're not God. Fasting humbles us. It helps us to approach the throne of grace in an appropriate frame of mind, an appropriate frame of heart and soul. It doesn't take long without food to feel hungry and weak and tired, and if you're anything like me, then irritable. We're tempted to muster up the strength to prove how invincible we are, to turn fasting into an opportunity for self-righteous pride. But again, that misses the point and undermines its purpose. Fasting is meant to expose our weaknesses, our vulnerability, our impotence before our God and our reliance on him. It does all of that because we are human. Without food, we die. That fact helps bring us to the right frame of mind. And I think it's why giving up TV or giving up social media or giving up chocolate doesn't quite have the same effect. However important you may think any of those things are, let me break it to you gently, it's not life-threatening to go without them. To go without food, however, means giving up something that we cannot do without. And so we're forced to realize that we're fragile, created beings. Fasting also helps us to focus on God, our creator, 
instead of focusing on the gifts that he's given us, including food. See, food is good. It's a God-given gift. It's given for our enjoyment. But like so many other gifts that God has given us, there is a danger that we focus on the gift and not on the giver. But fasting can help us to focus on God and to honor him as the giver of life and as the giver of all that is good. However, if fasting ends up causing you to focus more on food in an unhealthy way rather than on God, then fasting would not be good for you spiritually. And the other thing that fasting does is it exposes what's really going on inside our hearts and how much we need a saviour. So imagine you're fasting and you're hungry and you end up being impatient and irritable. Maybe you blow up in anger. Why? Well, it's because you haven't eaten, of course, isn't it? Is it really? What is it about hunger that makes us like that? Did Jesus act like that when he fasted? No. Hunger brings out what we're really like. Jesus was holy and righteous, and so he didn't sin, even in the midst of life-threatening hunger. But we sin because we're sinful, not because we're hungry. We behave like that because that is what we're really like. A good meal can help us to hide those attitudes from others and even from ourselves. But fasting and the hunger that it brings helps to expose the reality of our hearts. And then finally, in this section, here is a comment from a Christian blogger called Ian Paul. He makes a helpful point that life between Jesus' first and second coming is a mixture of joy and sorrow, a mixture of fasting and feasting. Listen to what he says. Feast days celebrate a world made by God and all the good in it. Alongside this, fast days signify repentance, mourning, and longing for deliverance. Just the thought of practice you might adopt if you are awaiting the deliverance of a Messiah and the breaking in of the age to come. Intermittent fasting is just the sort of thing you might continue to practice if you wanted to continue to both affirm the world that you live in and also to look for an age to come. It is the dietary expression of the now and not yet of the kingdom of God. In other words, the biblical pattern of feasting and fasting shows us what is true about this world. It also shows us that God has broken in and is making everything new. But it's a reminder that we're not there yet, that there is brokenness, and that one day, when Jesus finally returns, all will be right. One day we will no longer fast because the bridegroom will be back again. And so fasting is actually just the natural thing to do at various points, perhaps when we face bereavement or brokenness in our world. And feasting is the appropriate thing to do when we celebrate. And our lives as Christians should include both. We may as individuals, as a culture, prefer the feast. But until Jesus returns, there are also times when fasting is the natural thing to do. So when should we fast? The Old Testament uh, only directly commands fasting on one occasion a year, on the Day of Atonement. There were no signs that it was a regular devotional habit in Old Testament times. But we know it did happen a lot in the Old Testament, both individually and together as the people of God. And fasting was often a accompanied by an intense period of prayer. There are three specific points in the life of God's people. Firstly, at times of repentance. Secondly, when a key decision needed to be made. And thirdly, at a time of crisis. By Jesus' time, it seems that fasting has developed to be a more regular habit. So in Luke chapter 18, verse 12, when Jesus tells the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee prays and he says, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. Interestingly, we see all three examples of Jesus that we've just looked at. 
But it seems that by the time of Jesus, fasting was a normal practice. What about the New Testament times? Well, again, fasting is described individually and together as a church. And we see a very similar pattern, that it happens at times of repentance, when key decisions needed to be made, such as when choosing elders, and when there was a crisis. So just to pick up one of those examples, in Acts chapter 13, verses 2 to 3, we read these words. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now, was fasting a regular spiritual habit for New Testament believers? We honestly don't know. But one of the early Christian teaching documents about church life in the late first century, the Didache, describes Christians fasting twice a week, on Wednesdays and on Fridays. And that was deliberate, so that they fasted on different days to the Jews, who were in the habit of fasting Mondays and Thursdays. A little bit nearer in church history, we have John Wesley, who urged the Methodists to fast. He picked up that theme of Wednesdays and Fridays. And in fact, John Wesley wouldn't ordain anyone to ministry who didn't fast on those two days. Remembering the Old Testament pattern of fasting on the Day of Atonement, some Christians are still in the habit of fasting before they take communion. And Anglicans, amongst others, have often fasted on Fridays to mark the crucifixion. Now, I've not told you all of that because I think uh, we need to copy those exactly there to give you ideas. You see, how often we fast isn't important. There's no commands about that. It's between you and God. But it does seem that at certain points, fasting could be something that helps us as we focus on God and look to him in those situations. And so just briefly to end with, let's look at the question of how should we fast? Well, again, there is some evidence in that Didache document that the regular fasting of the early Christians went from after breakfast until the evening meal, rather than it being a 24 hour period without food, It's also worth saying that fasting normally involves not eating foods, but continuing to drink water. For some Christians, fasting means replacing normal meals with lighter foods or smaller portions. For others, it means missing those meals altogether. Many are able to spend the time that they would have been used for preparing and eating in prayer instead. Others simply continue with their usual activities and take those pangs of hunger as prompts to pray and to remember God. Again, it's important to say that some medical conditions, such as diabetes or pregnancy, if that's a medical condition, will mean thinking carefully about how to do this. And some of us will need to take medical advice before we consider fasting. But if what Jesus says here prompts you to fast, then why not start small and think about it? And... As we talk and think more about this, as I hope we will, remember that Jesus, remember what Jesus had to say to us about why we do what we do and avoid using this as a way of showing off. I'd also like to encourage us to speak and act sensitively, mindful of those who struggle with eating disorders and avoid causing our brothers and sisters to stumble. And then one final practical thing to bear in mind. In Matthew 6, verse 16 to 18, Jesus says this. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. To anoint your head meant to put oil on it. Now, I would suggest you don't do that. Not because I'm contradicting the Bible or Jesus' words. It's because Jesus' point is simply that we were to look normal. And putting oil on your head may have been normal then, but it's not now. So his point is simple. When you fast, wash your face and just look normal. Well, our time is up, but it seems to me that we would all do well to include fasting in our regular devotional life when it's appropriate, in much the same way as prayer or Bible reading would be. And so to end with, let me read you a quote and a challenge from a book called God's Chosen Fast by Arthur Wallace. Listen to what he says. In giving us the privilege of fasting as well as praying, God God has added a powerful weapon to our spiritual armory. 
In her folly and ignorance, the church has largely looked upon it as obsolete. She's thrown it down some dark corner to rust, and there it has lain forgotten for centuries. But an hour of impending crisis for the church and the world demands its recovery. Let's pray. Some words from Psalm 63, verses 3 to 5. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied in you, as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the love that you've shown us through him. Thank you that we don't need to try to impress you. Keep us from acting in a way that seeks the approval of others and the glory of others. And help us to remember your goodness and help us to live our lives to give you the glory and you alone. And Father, we admit that our lives gravitate towards a love of feasting and not of fasting. Father, help us, as is appropriate, to recognize the brokenness in this world, to seek you when we have decisions to make, to turn to you in repentance and in prayer, to trust you and to look to you. And Father, if fasting is appropriate, we pray that you'd help us to add that into our habits and lives, not in a way to show off, but in a way to deepen our love for you and our relationship with you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.